So we're moving on to gram negatives. Gram negatives are much more fun to talk about. Okay. So the first group of gram negatives will be gram negative bacterial non hemorrhagic fevers. Okay, we're good. Pretty long name. But if you break it down, it makes perfect sense. So those are fevers that are caused by gram-negative bacteria, and they do not involve hemorrhages like Ebola does. Does that make sense so far? So let's take a look. First several ones are Bartonella and Brucella. Bartonellas under one roof. Okay, so Bartonella, named after uh, those names, most of them are after folks. So the dude named Barton. Okay. So the first one is Bartonella hensley, causative agent of cat scratch disease, cat scratch fever. Okay. Transmission route, it's a zoonotic infection. Most frequently, you acquire it from via cat scratch, but it also can be acquired via tick bite. More, not as, as frequent, but um, let me get through a few and then I'll explain like what kind of symptoms we can expect here. Then we have Bartonella quintana. This is the causative agent of trench fever. Um, it's transmitted by lice. If you look at the transmission route, which is lice, and the name of the disease, which is trench fever, you can easily imagine which year it was discovered. It's around 1915, when World War I went to trenches. People were just infested with lice, and it was a big, big problem. So before we move further, I want to highlight the symptoms of all those non-hemorrhagic fevers. They all include things like high fever, headaches, muscle aches, joint aches. Does that make sense? fairly non-specific symptoms. We clear so far? So like for all of them, there are some that have sort of an extra symptoms, but that will be true for all of them. So for instance, next one, which is Brucella bordus. Positive agent of the condition known as brucellosis, also known as bang fever and undulant fever. So bang fever, that's the guy's last name, but what about undulant fever? So brucellosis, the course of, of disease, it's characterized by increase, increases and decreases in body temperature. Does that make sense? Pretty straightforward. Got it? Now, where do you, how do you contract it? From cattle. Now, if you look at the name, look, Brucella abortus. In cattle, this infection causes spontaneous abortions, which is pretty bad. I actually had a student who was a Peace Corps volunteer, uh, I think it was down in Peru, and she had brucellosis, okay? And 
She contracted it. Viable consumption. So the reason, look, and this is something that I, I try to tell. This, this is why we have pasteurization. So we don't contract all those crappy diseases, you know, through milk. We don't, we don't have to. So all this, all this idea of, oh, I'm going to kind of, you know, uh, uh, buy milk at the local farm directly from the cow, it's not a great idea really, you know, just get, we can pasteurize milk. Because then you have to pasteurize it yourself, and what's the difference? You know? Does that make sense? Good. Now, another group of, of diseases, um, they still are gram-negative bacterial non-hemorrhagic fevers, but I'm going to put intracellular pathogens. So the ones that are going to be listed under that roof are obligate intracellular pathogens. That make sense? Um, I'm actually going to start with kind of the most boring one. It's Relichia. So Relichia infects white blood cells. Different species infect different ones. Um, I think on a side of no, I don't remember. Well, basically, different species infect different types of white blood cells, neutrophils and macrophages. That's what they like. Okay, does that make sense? Now, transmission ticks. Okay. Then we have another very interesting microorganism. It's Coxiella burnettii. Along with two gram-positive bacteria, bacilli and clostridia, it's a spore-forming organism. And Coxiella causes so-called Q fever, very, very, very self-explanatory name, sarcosmo Um It's really bad fever. Okay. Now, transmission of Coxiella occurs, it's a zoonotic infection. can be transmitted by milk from domestic animals or can be transmitted by ticks. Okay, now look, this is what interesting about Coxiella. In nature, in real course of infection, Coxiella burnettii is obligate intracellular pathogen. Does that make sense? But if you move into the lab environment, you can grow it just on a guard plate if you if you have right conditions. It's kind of an interesting story. Okay. Finally, the most famous zoonotic intracellular pathogen belongs to Rickettsia species. There are several of them. Okay. So what the most famous, of course, is Rickettsia rickettsii. It causes Rocky Mountain spotted fever. So there's some rash here. Okay, we're good. And there's a Rickettsia provasiaki. causes rickettsial pox. Now look at this. In both cases, we have skin manifestations. So Rocky Mountain spotted fever, rash, rickettsial pox, looks like smallpox. Okay, all of rickettsia transmitted by ticks. That makes sense? And this is something kind of, you know, in the clinical settings, I want you to, I want, 
I, I understand that this is the microbial prey, but I want you to approach it from more of a like diagnostic standpoint. Like imagine there's a person who walks in and they have this rash on the skin and they have high fever and they tell you that they were bitten by a tick. And you think, okay, there are several options here. We're in the state of Ohio. So Lyme disease, eh, possibly, but it's more New England. Can it be rickettsia? It can be. Which one? Well, it's hard to say, but rickettsia rickettsia is the most common. Now, you may wonder why the hell it can be in Ohio if the name of the disease is Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. This is what I absolutely adore about scientists. They don't give a slightest shit about proper naming. It was isolated, and it's most common in states like Arkansas, Missouri, Tennessee, Kentucky, you know, in the forested areas there. But it was first characterized in Rocky Mountain Labs in Montana. And this is why they called it Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. It's incredibly hard to find there, but, you know, name stuck. That make sense? So all of these folks are obligate intracellular pathogens. All of these folks are um, non-hemorrhagic non -hemorrhagic fevers. Okay? We good? Now, I'm kind of trying to lay it out sort of in a logical way. So next microorganism that we're going to talk about is famous or infamous, call it whatever you want. I'm going to put it here because it is another obligate intracellular pathogen. Is it gram-negative? Oh, they, from now on, they all gram-negative. Media trachomatis. Okay. Um, obligate intracellular bacterial pathogen. Okay. So, first of all, it's the causative agent of STD, known as chlamydiasis. Sometimes we call it chlamydia. It's the second most common sexually transmitted disease in the United States. Any one, anyone wants to venture a guess which STD is number one in the US? Hmm? Not close. We talked about it in like maybe first class. Uh -huh. HPV is number one, chlamydia is number two. Kind of makes sense because those are probably least noticeable. HPV is absolutely unnoticeable STD until, and chlamydia is eh, not very noticeable. That makes sense? However, if it's left untreated, it will go all the route from, you know, vaginosis to endometriosis to sulpingitis to PID if it's left untreated in, in females. Does that make sense? And why I'm focusing on females? I, I don't want to say asymptomatic, but kind of not noticed infection is more common in females purely because of the anatomy. Does that make sense? In males, literally all the stuff is sticking out. It's much easier to spot the problem. In females, it's a little bit harder, so often they go longer without treatment. Make sense? So this is what happens to the carrier. Now another interesting condition that can be caused by chlamydia trachomatis is trachoma, which is neonatal conjunctivitis. When a mother is chlamydia positive, a newborn when is coming through the birth canal can acquire chlamydia, but in this case the infection will affect conjunctival and eye and untreated chlamydial conjunctivitis will result in loss of vision. 
It's very treatable with antibiotics. Uh, there was an attempt to even make a vaccine against trachoma. Um, never came to. I mean, the vaccine was made in Soviet Union, but it never made it into public health. Does that make sense? Now, I'm kind of laying them out next to each other because another um, STD is Neisseria gonorrhea, which shouldn't surprise you, causes gonorrhea. Interesting thing about Neisseria, it's the fastidious microorganism, which means it can be grown only in an um, enriched medium, medium that contains iron, either blood agar or chocolate agar. Okay, does that make sense? Again, in newborns, in newborns, it can lead to conjunctivitis. So far, so good. Look how closely matching those diseases are. So we've got a classic STD, and if it is transmitted to a newborn during the birth, conjunctivitis in both cases. Okay. Now, another species of Neisseria that I really, really want you to to understand and to know is. Neisseria meningitidis. Well, try to venture what kind of disease it causes. Meningitis, yes. It's meningitis. It's called, so it's meningococcal meningitis. Uh, the infection is transmitted by a respiratory route. It is very, very contagious. And unlike two other main causes of meningitis, so we have, we have Neisseria meningitidis, meningococcal meningitis. We have Streptococcus pneumoniae, streptococcal meningitis. And we're going to talk about Haemophilus influenza, which is... Um, HIV, you know, HIV vaccine, hemophilus meningitis. Streptococcus and hemophilus can establish just the respiratory infection. Often, that's it. You have like some respiratory symptoms. Neisseria uh, al almost always results in meningitis. Does that make sense to you? And the, the infection can be very, very fast. We're talking about a couple of days. So again, if you have a patient with a really high fever, stiff neck, confusion, altered state of mind, your best bet, and you, you can ask them, you can ask them, did you have a meningitis vaccine? And if they say no, then you can pretty safely assume that it is a bacterial meningitis and they should be treated with antibiotics right away. Does that make sense? Now, since it's a respiratory condition, technically, at least it starts as a respiratory condition that can be prevented by vaccination. Next to it, I wanted to position another respiratory pathogen that is Bordadella pertussis. So, again, do you want to venture a guess what is the disease? It's pertussis, also known to us as whooping cough. So, the infection with Bordadella has three distinctive stages. First is catarrhal stage, uh, basically cold. You have runny nose, you cough, 
nothing too serious. The problem is, at this particular stage, replicating Bordetella pertussis releases a toxin that destroys cilia in the uh, respiratory passages. That makes sense? And when cilia are gone, and that's kind of the mechanism of the toxin here, okay? So we're going to put cilia are gone. Mucus that was previously moved by that cilia upwards starts to accumulate. And I want to make it very clear because some students got confused before. Uh, they thought that the toxin increases the mucus production. It does not. You see what I'm saying? Cilia just gone and mucus is not moving anywhere and just gets stuck in there. And that results in accumulation of mucus, irritation of the respiratory passages, and paroxysmal stage. One of the symptoms of paroxysmal stage, along with, well, literally, whooping cough. Okay? Um, you should, I have a link in the notes. You can follow on YouTube the person with whooping cough. Coughs. It's awful. Uh, the bouts of cough can last for minutes, more than minutes, and they can be so violent that people will vomit and the blood vessels in their eyes will burst. So one of the symptoms is bloodshot eyes. That makes sense? It's even worse in children. <clears throat> so, um, eventually, now, what is, what is, I don't want to say funny, but amusing, is that when people reach paroxysmal stage, antibiotics are basically useless because the microorganism is largely gone. You know, cilia destroyed because of the toxin, but bug's not there. That makes sense? And then eventually, you know, you have convalescent stage after about two months. But the good news, there's a vaccine. So when you get when you get a DTAP, okay, you get diphtheria, tetanus, and acellular pertussis. This is something I wanted to comment on. So before it was DTP, diphtheria, tetanus, pertussis. But turns out the pertussis component of the vaccine was really, really associated with massive side effects. So people felt really like crap. Makes sense, right? So they did, they basically cleared the vaccine. Turning, it turns out uh, it was endotoxin, pertussis, that caused all those side effects. So they kind of cleared it up. So it became less reactogenic. The downside of that clearing up was that it also became less efficient. So pertussis vaccination is about 85% seroconversion, 85% efficacy in real life. Does that make sense? Which, this is something that you've got to keep in mind, that when there are reports, oh, we had cases of pertussis and people who received the vaccine. Yeah, it happens. Nothing is 100% effective. It's like blaming that people who used the um, seat belt and were driving in a car with airbags got killed in an accident. It's not 100% protection. It all, you know, depends. Sometimes even a small accident can result in things like that. Okay? Good? Clear?